Let us pray. O oh God, your word is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. So open our ears, our minds, our hearts, that we may receive the word you have for us this day. Amen. It's early January, which means that the season of Advent is a memory. Those weeks of preparing for Christmas to come, they're behind us now. After worship today, the Board of Spiritual Life would welcome help as they take down all the decorations and put the greens back in boxes since the holidays are over. Even so, I have a friend who likes to point out that we never really leave Advent. We are always waiting for promises to come true, after all. We are always longing for love to materialize, always scanning the news for the signs of the time, always wondering about endings and beginnings. We are always looking for level highways in the human wilderness that will lead us home again. Advent may be over as the calendar tells time, but Advent never leaves us. The desire for more justice and more joy, it's the permanent subtext of our lives. Christmas has come and gone as well. Although in our hearts, isn't there always a way in which it's Christmas? Aren't we always looking for heralds who say, be not afraid, with an authority we can trust? Aren't we always listening for glory-singing angels who have good news to proclaim and who send us like shepherds to go and see things for ourselves? Having found the child cradled in a manger in a stable out back, we can take in the truth that God is always present, even in the places we least expect. Having adored that unfathomable baby on bended knee, we can be amazed again by the ingenuity with which God is always entering our lives. Christmas may be over, but Christmas never leaves us because by it, God has forever blurred the lines between heaven and earth and human life has forever been revealed as divine. Albert Einstein once reflected that there are only two ways to live and look at your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. Everything. And everyone who celebrates Christmas gets to dwell in the everything as miracle side of things. We get to see how all that is lowly is lifted up. As one poet put it, there is gold in the straw and myrrh in the dung on the floor. The cows smell of frankincense, the dogs bark hosanna, and the star shows seekers from every corner of the earth where to look for God. Not up in the heavens, but in the gorgeous muck and hubbub of the world. It's by the light of that star that the Magi enter the story from the East. These wise seekers and worldly travelers usually get added to the pageantry of Christmas Eve, perhaps because they have the best costumes. But in the church calendar, they also get their own day to shine. Epiphany. Epiphany is the day after the 12th day of Christmas, which was Friday. And so Epiphany evening, last night, 60 of us gathered to remember them and to undertake our own journey, beginning in the chapel and then following a pole-born star on a silent procession lit by dripless candles and glow sticks through the whole church building. Together, we blessed every corner of this house with prayer and light until we found our way here to this room, the sanctuary, where we took turns filling the baptismal font with water. We baptized four members of the McAvoy Champlin family and the Bowler twins, five children and one adult. And in the shower that followed, 
Water sprayed from evergreen branches as the rest of us then got a chance to remember our own baptisms too. Sitting in the splash zone, we all got a little bit wet. And we remembered the story of Jesus' own baptism in the water of the River Jordan, when the sky split open and the dove descended and the voice of God was heard to proclaim, This is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. We heard and felt that blessing in the water and in the call it carries to follow the one who is baptized before us. The word epiphany means revelation. And the whole season that comes afterward, the season we enter today, carries with it an invitation to see the ministry of Jesus as a revelation of God's hope for the world. All season long, the veil lifts and we gather insights about how God works in the world. In the gospel Jesus proclaims, in the healing he offers and the mercy he extends, in the love he lifts up and gives away, in the company he keeps, and in the daily work he shares with others and calls us to join. Epiphany is a time of growing awareness when eyes of faith flood with the beauty of the one who walks around in the world leaking light everywhere he goes. Come and see, Jesus says in the scripture of this season, Come and see, which is what the shepherds did at Christmas, what the Magi did at Epiphany, what the people did as the crowds accompanying Jesus grew, what the disciples did as they sat at his feet and learned from him, and what we are called to do even now. Come and see, Jesus says. And then, in the next breath, Jesus says, go and tell. The shepherds return from the manger praising God, and the magi wisely, protectively, defy Herod's instruction, bypassing him to return home another way. Go and tell, Jesus says, as he sends his disciples out in his name to preach and heal and bear witness to the light they have seen and the light they are themselves becoming. Come and see, go and tell. Or as the poet Mary Oliver puts it, pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. That's the message of this season, a time when we learn that discipleship is both about adoring and serving, perceiving and doing seeking and finding, and when we find or are found, when we encounter the immense and saving brightness of God's love and light, we share its good news with others. With all this in mind, we decided to set our annual stewardship appeal inside this season. Yes, moving the time when we gather our financial pledges for the church's operating budget from the fall to January has some other advantages, like evening out the work of the stewardship and finance committees and the church office at the end of the year and the beginning of the next. But for the stewardship ministry and our church council, the most compelling reason to move stewardship to this season the thing that excited us the most lies in our wondering how we might grow in faith and giving by dwelling intentionally in the light of epiphany, following the one who is the light of the world and focusing our vision on the light we see in each of our own lives, in our life together as a congregation, in the signs of hope we see in the world, and in our calling to be a beacon of love and light in a frazzled and weary world. In fact, each week during this month-long season of stewardship, 
Members of this congregation will offer testimonies in worship, bearing witness to where they see light, how they have been changed by the encounter, how they are called to be light, and in some cases, what it means and how they think about their giving to the church. As they come and go and see and tell, you also are invited to notice and dwell in the light. And if you like, to share your insight, to write it down on a paper star that's available for you at the door when you leave. The stewardship ministry will gather and raise these stars for all to see and be guided by. A slightly different question each week for us to reflect on. For this week, the question is where do you see light in our life together as a congregation? Where do you see light in our life together? If I were to answer that question about what I see in you as fully as I'd like to, we'd be here for hours. So let me lift up just one day. Sunday, December 24th. With a full evening of worship planned for the evening of Christmas Eve, the staff and the Board of Spiritual Life assumed that the morning service would be small. We set it in the chapel and gave the choir the morning off. But at 10.30, when worship was ready to begin, the chapel was full and people were still coming in. We opened the doors, set up more chairs in the hallways, and many people stood through the whole service. 151 people showed up for a space that holds less than half that many. No one was unhappy about the overflow. December 24th also fell on our monthly turn to serve Soup Kitchen. Our volunteers were especially pleased to be feeding our hungry neighbors on Christmas Eve. But when it was time to say goodbye to our guests, our volunteers decided it was too cold to let them go outside. So everyone stayed through the whole afternoon so that our homeless guests would stay warm until it was time for them to move to the next location for dinner. And then in the evening, between 4 and 10 p.m., our sanctuary filled three times with worshipers, many of you who showed up once or twice more, but also many visitors, travelers from other parts of the country, and members of the wider community. There were more than 1,100 people who came for Christmas, people who needed carols and candlelight and your good company, who longed for God's promise of justice and joy, who prayed for peace on earth, who came to dwell in the ancient story we cherish about angels and shepherds and magi, about a child born out in the back, about a God who loves us beyond all belief, and about the miracle of a light that shines in the darkness, a light that cannot be overcome. In you, I see a light that shines and serves and sings and sings and shows up no matter what, and stays. Come and see, Jesus says. And if we come, and if we see, and if by his grace we stay, we will never leave Epiphany, and Epiphany will never leave us. Come and see, he says, and if we do, we will become like him, all light from light. And if we go and if we tell, we will take this light everywhere we go. Amen. <laughs>